Happy Sabbath. Um, do you like the, the happy Sabbath greeting? Does that, is that like music to your ears? I love hearing those words, happy Sabbath. Um, but I've observed over the years that if you hear something over and over again, you can kind of go into intellectual neutral and forget what it means. You, you know what I'm saying? If you say something over and over again, you can just say it over and over again and forget what you're talking about, can't you? So sometimes I like to change up my Sabbath greeting in order to remind myself and maybe remind a few others what it means. So my new Sabbath greeting, um, I, I would like you to try it on one another. I'm going to try it on you, and you can try it on one another, okay? Here it is. Here's my new Sabbath greeting, reminding me and maybe reminding you what the Sabbath means. Happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. <laughs> Happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. Now it's your turn. Say it to somebody next to you. Go ahead. Give it a try. <laughs> I mean, seriously, isn't that what the Sabbath means? The Sabbath is about finished work of creation, yes, and finished work of redemption in Christ, right? So we're sitting on a gold mine of theological truth with the Sabbath. Uh, it's reminding us continually, if we tune into what it means, of the salvation that we have in Christ alone, right? I tried that Sabbath greeting uh, at a church I was visiting not long ago. I uh, walked into the foyer and I saw this guy. He looked like an elder. He had that kind of elder-esque look, you know? I thought, he's an elder. So I said, I'm gonna try my Sabbath greeting on him. I said, happy salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone day. And he looked at me, he wasn't blinking, he wasn't smiling, and he, ha he said to me in return, he said, happy you better keep the Ten Commandments before Jesus comes day. <laughs> well, I realized what I had on my hands here. <laughs> and the revolution must continue in Adventism, so I said, Happy if we love him, we will keep his commandments day. <laughs> to which he responded, Happy are you aware that the investigative judgment is underway and the cases of the living will be coming up soon, so you had better get ready day? <laughs> to which I responded, Happy I've read Daniel 7 and 8, and judgment is in favor of the saints of the Most High God Day. <laughs> and that was the end of it. <laughs> the gospel won that day in the foyer with the elder. Praise God. Well, this morning, I want to explore something with you that is in, in the logical train of the line of thinking that we've been developing together. And in order to get there, I want to introduce to you what I regard to be one of the most remarkable books ever published back in the 1930s, late 1930s, I think it was 1939. Um, a scholar from New York who had been doing decades of research, Joseph Campbell, published a remarkable book with a remarkable title. You will immediately sense the genius in the title alone. The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Now, of course, the number thousand there is poetic. It's representative of an idea, a concept, that in fact, Joseph Campbell is reporting to us that after decades of research looking into all the different myths and stories and heroes of cultures everywhere in the world, he came to the conclusion that all the heroes are the same everywhere you look. In fact, he reports to us in this body of research that all the myths and stories, all the narratives are the same anywhere you look. Now, he's looking at ancient cultures all over the globe. And these people are not comparing notes. There's no plagiarism going on. The internet does not exist when these stories and narratives are being developed. People are somehow developing precisely the same basic narrative in every culture all over the world through all human history. 
And Joseph Campbell, he's baffled by this. He's thinking, this is very strange. Why is it that people are coming up with the same basic story everywhere without comparing notes? There must be some kind of psychological phenomenon, he's thinking. There's something embedded in human nature that is giving rise to this story because everybody's saying the same thing with the names changed and the places changed, but the same basic story. So he describes what he's discovered. He speaks of, he speaks of mankind's one great story. He calls it the timeless vision of humanity. Everybody sees reality the same way, and the way they see reality is coming up in the stories that we're ta telling. And then he asks a question because he's, he's confused by this. He's thinking, well, I don't understand why people would be coming up with the same story everywhere. So, so he asks the question, I, I, he's asking himself, he's asking the reader, from what profundity of mind does it derive? What's going on in the human psyche universally that would give rise to a single narrative? What, what, what in the world's going on here? And then he says this, why is mythology everywhere the same beneath its varieties of costume? You know, it doesn't matter if you're talking about Molech or Zeus, Ishtar or Dagon. Wherever you find heroes emerging in human narrative, they bear the same basic characteristics. This is fascinating. This is what I'm going to call the universal narrative. The universal narrative. This language is important for where we're going, so take it on board. The universal narrative. Now, the universal narrative, according to Joseph Campbell, and according to, as we're going to see, even the stories we're familiar with today in contemporary storytelling, the universal narrative has two basic characteristics. Characteristic number one, all of the heroes operate with a power over others orientation. A power over others orientation. The second characteristic of the universal narrative is that the heroes in all these stories use force to fight their enemies. Are you still tracking with me? I hope you're gathering this information because there's a punchline. So the universal narrative has these two characteristics. Now, the thing that's fascinating about this is that in all the stories, the hero in the story the savior, the deliverer, the one who intervenes to stop evil, evil forces, listen carefully now, operates by the same basic principles as the evil they're fighting. Just more of it. So, so, so the hero is just more powerful than the villain. But it's the same basic kind of power that is at play in the narrative. And we see this in modern contemporary narratives. Okay, right now, Avengers Endgame just surpassed all movies to be the highest box office grossing movie of all time. It passed that one with the guy with the beautiful hair on the front of the ship, what's that one? Titanic, passed that one. What's the, what's the other one with the, the weird people trying to save the earth, the environmentalist movie? Avatar. Those were the top two. This story just surpassed both. And this story is the common hero myth in what we call the Marvel comics and the superhero myths of our time. Batman, Superman, Iron Man, 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 man. <laughs> over and over again, some doodly dude with really big muscles, Thor, Whoever it might be is stepping up to fight evil, listen, with evil. So this is the story that, that Walter Wink, uh, another biblical scholar um, from New York, 
actually Joseph Campbell wasn't a biblical scholar, he was an anthropologist and he was looking at human narrative and he was more in the realm of philosophy and history. But Walter Wink was a biblical scholar and he coined a term, a phrase, to describe this universal storyline. He referred to it as the myth of redemptive violence. Now he fleshes it out. He says that the myth of redemptive violence is the belief that violence saves. By the way, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, and if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, welcome. We're glad you're joining us uh, this morning. I think you're going to also benefit from the things that we're discovering. But those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, you will begin to realize something as we go through our time together. You will begin, perhaps, to realize why it is that embedded in Adventist theology and practice is something that we call conscientious objection to violence in time of war. Because within the Adventist theological system is a fundamental overturning of the power over orientation, if we're paying attention to what our theological system gives us. So Walter Wink comes along and he says, this idea that, that, that violence can somehow conquer violence, he says, this is a myth. He said it doesn't work. The belief that violence saves, that's what it is. That, that war brings peace and that might makes right. And then, and then he observes, this is amazing. He says, violence never stops violence because its very success leads others to imitate it. In other words, it works in the short term. But it is not, listen, listen, listen. It is not an eternally sustainable principle. In the short term, violence seems to overcome evil. I mean, you've got a bomb, we'll build a, we'll build a bigger bomb. You've got a military, we'll have a bigger military. We'll make sure that nobody does anything wrong by doing wrong by being of the same fundamental character as the thing that is trying to be defeated. This is what Jesus was getting at. Jesus actually, not Walter Wink, is the source of the idea of the myth of redemptive violence or the overturning of the myth when he said to Peter, put your sword away. Why put your sword away? Because he said, listen, listen, Jesus said to Peter, anybody who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. That's the cycle. That's the myth that violence saves, that violence makes evil go away. It doesn't make evil go away. It perpetuates evil, and Walter Wink understands this. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that Joseph Campbell um, is right in his observation of the universal myth the power over myth, the force and violence myth that shows up everywhere. But I'm going to suggest to you that, that there is one single counter-narrative in human history. By the way, and it's one of the evidences that the story is true. Because nobody would have ever come up with it. The story of Jesus is not something that would have ever occurred to fallen human beings as a fiction. We could not have made up the story of Jesus because we're narcissistic and power-hungry by nature. So it never occurs to us to make up a story where the hero is defeated. So there's a single counter-narrative on display before us in history. Now watch this. The single counter-narrative says that, that the hero of this story, the deliverer, the liberator, the savior of this story, operates by a power under orientation. And the hero of this story, rather than using force to combat evil, the hero of this story uses love to fight evil. And hence, evil is being conquered at the deepest psychological level by pulling the enemy into voluntary love in return. 
It's the most profound story ever told. So Jesus comes into the world. Check this out. This is amazing, you guys. I hope you're, I hope you're tracking with us. Because what you believe, if you would get in touch, what I believe, if I would get in touch with what I believe, if we would get in touch with what we believe, we have the makings of the revolution that will lighten the earth with the glory of God and overturn all oppressive power systems. It's the most remarkable thing ever, ever, ever to occur in all of universal history, what we see taking place in Christ. So check this out. Jesus comes into the world, and there's a context. The context is that everybody in the world operates by a single narrative. Power over and trying to conquer evil with evil. Jesus comes along and he says, okay, I'm here now. And he announces something. He says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is remarkable. The word kingdom here is a word that refers to governance. It's, it's a power word. It's a, it's a way of governing. It's a way of, so you could, doing no violence to the text, you could say that Jesus announces, he's saying, listen, listen, a new way of governing is here. Or you could say it this way. The politics of God are at hand. Some of you are getting nervous. <laughs> Don't get nervous. We're just here to preach the gospel. Amen. Okay, now, Jesus did not just say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's the full statement. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the word repent is very fascinating in this context. Jesus is launching a kingdom, a governing system, a political revolution. And he prefaces the announcement of the kingdom by saying, repent. Now, we have reduced the repentance idea to individual personal repentance alone on my knees to change my behavior for personal salvation. Now, there's some truth to that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying metanoio, which simply means in skateboarding terms, that's where I come from anyway, so it makes sense to me to think in skateboarding terms. <laughs> Metanoio means do a 180. Turn around and go the opposite direction. In other words, Jesus isn't at this point saying, hey, um, repent of your personal behavioral misdemeanors, whatever they are, your personal moral failings. He's saying, repent, that is, Flip your perspective completely because a new way of governing has just landed on earth. He's saying, I'm here to announce a whole new way to be human. So flip your perspective. Jesus came into the world and he was a script-flipping Messiah. All of the people who were looking for a Messiah, Peter, James, John, the disciples and all of Israel, they, were, they knew the Messiah was coming. They were looking for a king, a ruler, and they wanted a particular kind of king, a particular kind of Messiah. They wanted a military Messiah. This is evident as you just read through the four Gospels. They were looking for somebody who would overthrow the Romans with violence, set up a throne, put James and John on either side, Make Peter, I don't know, the vice president of the whole system. They were looking for a, well, they were looking for the same hero that was embedded in the human psyche from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned and overturned love in favor of power as the human relational dynamic. Jesus came and he said, no, 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 I'm not going to be the kind of king you want. Now, he was very, very gingerly about this. He knew they couldn't process it. So he wasn't like just 
blurting things out. He was saying, there are many things I would tell you, but you can't bear them now. But brace yourself, because this is not like anything you've ever seen. And over and over again, he prophesied that he, the king, the Messiah, would come under the power systems of our world and apparently be defeated by them, but the defeat itself would constitute the victory. So Jesus flips the whole script of human understanding. Now, he taught exactly what his kingdom would be like. In Matthew chapter 20, he said things like this. He said to his disciples, and, and they weren't processing any of this. They, they didn't get it. They didn't know what he was talking about. But he said, okay, let me try to break this down for you. He said, you know, you know, you know. This is the universal story. Everybody's familiar with it. I'm not telling you anything new, Jesus. You know how it all operates. You know how the system works. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are of great authority exercise authority over them. Notice this is the power over orientation. If you're in charge, you're over. If you're the authority figure, you call the shots. You give orders. There is obedience on the premise of your authority. And then Jesus says this, yet it shall not be so among you. What shall not be so among you? the exertion of authority over one another. It shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. This is remarkable. This is so completely counterintuitive to anything they were expecting and that any of us expect. He then said this, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is, this is so astounding. Listen, listen very carefully now. Jesus didn't come in the world simply to save me, the individual. He came into the world to save us, the corporate human unit. Amen. He came into the world to save our systems of relationship with one another, whether it is the system between husbands and wives. There's a relational dynamic going on there. Parents and children, there's a relational dynamic going on there. Colleagues at work, fellow believers in a local church, fellow believers in a worldwide church. Jesus came to redeem human beings corporately, not just individually. Because my individual salvation has impact on the way I perceive and relate to you. Amen. The way I treat you as a fellow human being. Now, Friedrich Nietzsche, no doubt the most famous atheist um, of modern times, still in postmodernism, he's quoted often by people who are pushing back on religion in general and Christianity in particular. He offered a scathing critique of Christianity. He's the one who popularized, well, he didn't popularize, he coined the term God is dead, which in the 1960s and 70s became a popular bumper sticker in the United States. God is dead. Now, the thing that people don't understand about Nietzsche is he wasn't making, in his God is dead statement, he wasn't so much making a statement regarding God's existence. He indicates otherwise that he's not even sure. Does God exist or not? I don't know. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that, listen, that Christianity, by its power mongering, has killed the credibility of God in the minds of the masses. So Nietzsche comes along and he does something like what Joseph Campbell did, the hero with a thousand faces guy. And he looks at all of history, all of ancient history, and he sees what's going on and how people relate to one another, 
how power systems work, how governing systems work. And then Nietzsche comes up against Jesus because you can't analyze history without taking Jesus into account. So he comes to Jesus now. He's analyzed everything, and he says, this is his, this is his, his, his final critique of Christ. Watch this. He says, modern men, himself among them, modern men hardened as they are to all Christian terminology. He's acknowledging that there is, at this point, there is a pushback on Christianity in philosophy, in science, in academia in general. He was a part of an academic system that was critiquing religion, critiquing Christianity, and academia in general was pushing back on Christianity. And he's saying, we, modern people, we're hardened to all Christian terminology. We don't like it. We're done with Christianity. That's what he's saying. Modern men, hardened as they are to all Christian terminology, okay, but then he says this, we no longer appreciate the horrible extravagance which, for all ancient taste, lay in the paradox of the formula, God on a cross. Never before, he says, had there been anywhere such an audacious inversion. You know what inversion is. That's when you, you know, turn a pair of socks inside out. You invert. You turn something the opposite. He's saying there's never been a time in history I can't find any record of anything like this Jesus fella. Jesus completely inverts reality. He flips it on its head. He turns everything upside down. All of human history is going along, just chugging along with one narrative, one story, one narrative, one story, and then Jesus comes along and he is the exact opposite of everything that's ever been. Never before, he says, had there been anywhere such an audacious inversion. Never anything, he's talking about Jesus, never anything so terrifying, so challenging, and challengeable as this formula. What formula? He just told us. God on a cross? Really? It, this God on a cross idea, are you still tracking? This God on a cross idea, it promised a transvaluation of all ancient values. It turned everything in reverse. Nothing after Jesus could ever be the same again. And this is a guy who doesn't even believe in Jesus. He's just analyzing the data. He's just reading the Gospels, and he's saying, now that's unique. Everything is the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. And then there's Jesus. Jesus is different because Jesus completely reframed power as love. Jesus said, you want to see some power? I'm here now. And the power that you're about to witness on display is the power of self-giving, self sacrificing love for my enemies. You're about to see some power now. It's not the kind of power you were looking for. It's not like anything you've ever imagined because you're pretty dysfunctional and messed up yourself. So there's no way for you to ever think this up. But I'm about to redeem you out of all coercive systems of thought and behavior in to love. So Jesus comes along, and he's changing everything. George MacDonald, the guy who C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, both of them credit as the master thinker of history, that C.S. Lewis said, I owe all my thoughts and everything I've written to George MacDonald. George MacDonald was a Scottish preacher and poet and storyteller. He just rode around on a horse preaching sermons and telling stories. And he articulated what we're getting at this morning by saying this. Is power or love the making might of the universe? Let, let, me, let me translate that for you. He's saying, is, is, it, is it power, sheer authority? 
Is it power or is it love that undergirds reality at its foundation? What is the thing behind the thing behind the thing behind the thing that gives meaning to reality? Is it power or is it love? And he's saying, he who answers this question aright has the key to all righteous questions. He's saying, listen, listen, if you can answer this one question, at its core, is reality all about power or is it all about love? If you can answer that one question, you have in embryonic form the answer to all good questions. Everything else will make sense to you if you undergo the primary fundamental paradigm shift from power to love as the primary constituent of reality. And by the way, this was, this was the point of my conversion. I could not have become a Christian. I could not have become a follower of Jesus. I could not have become a Seventh-day Adventist without this single idea. This was the idea that completely inverted my entire way of thinking as a teenager and led me to consider Jesus as the only unique contribution in history. This is why I became a Seventh-day Adventist. By the way, it is in the providence of God that I encountered Adventism because I could not have become a Baptist, for example. There's nothing wrong with Baptists. I love Baptists. I have Baptist friends. But theologically, philosophically, I could not have become a Baptist because Calvinism at its base is power-oriented. Adventism at its theological base is love-oriented. There's no way I could have taken Calvinism or determinism or eternal torment or anything in the vicinity of a picture of God of that nature. I could not have taken it on board because it would have been the same in character and principle as the abusive stepfather that was beating my mom, which was what kept me from Jesus and from God until I saw that Jesus, that God is completely different than anything going on in this world. That's an aside. That's not a part of this message. Okay, so then Jesus comes into the world. And you remember what he announced earlier in our time together this morning? Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Paul takes that idea and he reworks it with different language. And he says something that we as Seventh-day Adventists struggle with. Man, we don't know what to do with this verse. In fact, most of us sitting here this morning, we probably read that and thought, oh, why did Paul have to say that? That doesn't help our, our argument in favor of the law. Sounds rather antinomian. Why did Paul say things like this? Well, the moment we understand it in the context of what we're talking about here, it makes perfect sense. So Paul says in Romans 10.4, he says Christ, this Christ who said repent, because a new political governing system is now here. Paul said Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is not antinomianism because the word that Paul uses for end is the word telos, from which we get words like telescope, Teleological, the word literally means trajectory, something like that. It means something like the end goal or the end product or the thing to which everything is tending. Are you tracking with me at all? Telescope. A telescope is used to see way out into the horizon. So Jesus is the telos of the law. Jesus is, Jesus is the one to whom the entire Old Testament corpus was pointing. It was all penultimate to the ultimate, and the ultimate is Jesus. All of the writings of Moses and all of the writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the prophets, all of it was teleological to Christ. All of it was pointing to him. In what sense? How is it that Jesus is the teleological end, the telos of the law, 
That is the entire Old Testament. It includes the Ten Commandments. It includes the entire, it's, it's just the law. It's the law and the prophets. It's the whole kit and caboodle. He, he's, he could have just as easily said the whole Old Testament, but he wasn't thinking Old Testament at that. He was just thinking the Hebrew Scriptures. It was just called the law and the prophets. So he's saying Jesus is the end, the telos. Okay, in what sense? Okay, I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus in his kingdom announcements and in his life and in his death and resurrection, that Jesus has set in reverse motion a trajectory toward or back to love as the only relational dynamic that we know as human beings. So God created human beings in the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2 record not just the creation of humankind, but a particular kind of being, a particular kind of relating. Adam and Eve had a certain kind of relational dynamic with one another and with God and with the creation as a whole. When human beings sinned, it was in a very real sense a forfeiture of that mode of being. So that mode of being was basically Human beings were created in the image of God, and the image of God is self-giving, other-centered love. Human beings were created to think, to feel, and to relate like God thinks and feels and relates. With focus and consciousness centered on the other, whoever the other happens to be in any given moment. Are you still with me or am I losing you? Okay, so, so Jesus comes into the world, <laughs> and I, I tell you what, he's amazing. If, you don't, if, you, if, you, if you've wondered whether you like him or not, you're about to like him a lot. Okay, so Jesus comes into the world, and what he's essentially doing is he is, he is undoing or setting in reverse. He's basically making the human race young again. He is growing us young. He's taking us back to the future, <laughs> to quote Toy Story. Okay, he's taking us back to the future, back to the future. The future looks like the past. Eternity future has the same colors and contours as Genesis 1 and 2. Whatever's going on in Genesis 1 and 2, that's what's going on in eternity future. And Jesus is the one who is the end to which the whole narrative, the whole story was headed straight for him. And in Jesus, we see a complete upending, a complete inversion of all human relational dynamics. So that Paul will later on, in one of his letters to the Corinthians, he will say that all systems of authority and power are winding down, Paul says, to an infinite nil, N-I-L, nothing, nothing. It's all coming, he says, to nothing. It's all coming to nothing. All of the power systems of our world that operate by the premise of power over others, it's all winding down, winding down, winding down. It's not sustainable. A marriage is not sustainable the moment you begin to exert psychological, emotional, or relational maneuvers of coercion, your beloved begins to lean out. Relationships always fracture when power is applied. But to the degree that you give space and freedom within the relational dynamic, the beloved leans in. To quote 38 Special, a 1970s rock band, I love this lyric, I'm sorry, I wish it was a Bible verse. It's not, but I have to quote it. Okay, here it is. Hold on loosely, but don't let go, because if you hold too tight, you're going to lose control. That's how reality operates on all levels. If you try to raise your children by maintaining control over them until they're 36, they will move to another state. <laughs> they will create space between you and them. If you, if you follow the counsel, for example, of Ellen White, where she says, throw your, your kids on their, the, their own freedoms as fast as possible. Just, just set them free. 
as soon as they can responsibly bear the freedom. So within Ellen White's child raising philosophy, for example, it go, it's something like this. She, she essentially says um, that the best way to raise children is to have as few rules as possible and mean it. And to give as much freedom as possible as m the moment they can bear it. Then your children will want to actually hang out with you when they become adults. That's a child raising seminar right there in parentheses. Okay. So Jesus comes into the world and he's doing something remarkable, something absolutely astounding. He is setting everything in reverse. Everyone who believes the gospel will, as we're going to discover this evening, get younger and younger and younger in innocence and beauty. That's for tonight. So Paul is saying in Romans, essentially, that human beings in their immaturity find it necessary to have a law that presides over them as a externally imposed power. You shall, you shall not. But the gospel matures human beings to the place where they begin to experience the law as internally realized power. Not I have to, I want to. Not I better, but I'm in love. Not God is telling me what to do and he's more powerful than I am, so I guess I better get my act together because after all, I want to go to the good place, not the bad place. And don't kid yourself, even the Adventist hell is bad. Okay? <laughs> Nobody wants to go there wherever it is, okay? So here's the fact of the matter. Our growing up into Christ is growing up into, growing up into love as our only mode of being. So Jesus comes into the world and he is, he, oh, he's doing things. He's not just telling cute little stories. He's overturning the entire world system at all levels. <laughs> He's so amazing. So Jesus is remaking all levels of reality in the image of his love. That's, that's what he's doing. That's what he's here for, okay? And this is panning out right before our eyes. You happen to be living at one of the most exciting periods of human history. Now, it has its downsides. There's no doubt about it. But Western culture, whether it acknowledges Jesus or not, is living in the trajectory of his telos. Jesus has set in motion, or he's released into motion, principles that have been working themselves out down through human history from the time that he gave his life and resurrected. What's been happening is the principles that he released into action have been working themselves out. This is a total aside. I was just at the uh, North American Division Re Religious Liberty Summit, did three presentations there called The Politics of Jesus. And the point there was to suggest, and you know, I don't have time to develop this, but consider this for a minute. The Constitution, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America is essentially the gospel in the form of governing documents. Now, we don't know that. We think, ah, no, no, just really smart people came up with this. No, smart people didn't come up with the democratization of human power. Jesus came up with it. Paul was the theo theologian who articulated it. And the principles that we see in Christ and in Paul began to weave their way in to human systems until finally this idea that all men are created equal, endowed with inalienable rights, and even, even our messed up nation, because we're fallen human beings, all of us everywhere, we were able, our founding fathers were able to articulate the principles while disobeying them with slave trade. But the principles are so powerful that they are, they're gonna work themselves out. And that's what we see taking place in business, in corporate 
world. What's happening, we're witnessing right now one of the byproducts of the gospel in the sense that authority-based systems are giving way to information-based systems. It used to be that authority is power. There's the guy who's in charge. He's called the CEO. And he tells people what to do. But what's happening now is we are witnessing right before our eyes, we are witnessing a remarkable thing take place. People now have universal access to information. So everybody is becoming equal in a very real sense for the first time in history. Consider the book The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. New York Times bestseller. What do you mean the world is flat? Is he a flat earther? No, he believes the earth is a sphere like um, everybody who, anyways, I won't go there. So the earth is not flat. It's a metaphor in his book. And he's simply saying this, follow, track with him. He's saying that universal access to information is in the process of flattening the world. In other words, everybody's eye to eye now. A lot of corporations don't need CEOs anymore. What is valued now is creativity over authority. So his second point that I'm deriving from the book is that we right now at this point in history, we are witnessing, if you pay attention, you'll see it happening. We are witnessing the democratization of all governing systems and the equalizing of all persons on planet Earth right now. You call United Airlines and you will be talking to somebody in India. The world is flat. Everything's, all the systems are flattening out. And so this has a byproduct for human relationships. Competition is out and collaboration is in. And number four, leaders that try to control invariably lose credibility. <clears throat> because the fact is that our current, I guess it's being called the millennial generation, they value relational dynamics over money. So one person after another nowadays is saying, I don't need to work for you if you're a jerk. I don't need job security. I'll go live in my mom's basement <laughs> until I get another job. But I'm not going to endure your brutality and verbal abuse in the workplace. Because if you haven't noticed, I'm human just like you. So everything's being equalized. And so the Christian leader leads, if the Christian leader is in touch with the gospel and understanding the principles that pan out in leadership, the Christian leader leads from the center, not from the top. It's not hierarchical in God's system. It's influence that is moving out. It's empowerment of others rather than domination of others. The Speed of Trust is one of the best books you'll ever read if you want to understand the democratization of power. Stephen Covey, the, the, the senior who is now deceased, who wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, I guess the best-selling business book of all time, which was basically a reworking of the Law of Moses in the form of business principles. I don't have time to go into that, but his son wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. Now, it's an odd title, isn't it? Is trust fast? Well, the whole point of the book is that, yes, trust is very fast. In what sense? In the sense of productivity and creativity. Watch this. His father, before his death, wrote the foreword for the book and summarizes the speed of trust concept. Nothing is as fast as the speed of trust, Covey says. Nothing is as fulfilling as relationships of trust. Nothing is as inspiring as an offering of trust. So then the book outlines and says this, that the first job of the leader is to inspire trust. It's to bring out the best in people by entrusting them with meaningful stewardships. In other words, delegating power rather than retaining it. Empowering people to do what it is within their giftedness to do and to create an environment in which this is so beautiful. The gospel in the form of business principles and to create an environment in which high trust interactions inspire creativity and possibility. 
So the book, I'm gonna summarize now, the book is essentially saying that leadership is not about the exertion of authority, really. It's about the building of synergy through trust. Trust is the currency of healthy group dynamics. Number three, and this is so crucial, if you sit on a church board, if you're involved in leadership on any level, if you have a job, if you're involved in any group dynamics, listen, investment of resource, whether in the form of money, time, energy, creativity, is a natural response to trust. This is, by the way, how the stock market works. The only reason why the, the, the numbers go up is because people are generally trusting the system. The moment trust is lost, people begin to pull out, and that's how it works in all relationships. As I said earlier, in a marriage, in a child, raising dynamic, people who feel dominated lean out. People who feel trusted lean in. So people will bring their best to the table. Their creativity will flourish. They will bring their best to the table in relational dynamics that are gospel grounded in the dynamic of trust. So posturing for preeminence, posturing for preeminence, is an antitrust maneuver. The moment a church leader, a pastor, an elder, a president, where's Ed? The moment a church leader postures for preeminence, trust begins to recede and people back out. But the moment a leader begins to demonstrate authentic trust in the giftedness the qualities, the talents, the abilities, through delegation, through, hey, 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 I trust you. You do that because you're amazing. Oh, I am? Yes, you are. Well, I'm glad you agree. <laughs> Number five, if a team is shutting down, any team is shutting down and failing to produce in the workplace, in the church, it's a symptom of broken trust invariably. People back out when trust is broken. The church of God is a community of equals under one head, Jesus Christ. This is, this is church 101, and we as Seventh-day Adventists need to be retaught it. We need to remind ourselves that the gospel pans out in a leadership system. So, the most effective leader will empower, this is a summary of everything that we've discovered so far, the most effective leader will empower from the center, build trust, and mobilize individual genius. You say, well, I'm not a genius. Yes, you are. Albert Einstein says, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. <laughs> His point is this, in my words, the genius is not a special kind of person. It's like, oh, there's a genius. We got a genius in the room. No, no, no. The genius is not a special kind of person. Rather, each person is a special kind of genius. This is the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts. God has endowed everyone with the capacity to make a profound difference in the world. Everyone, no exception. Each member of the body of Christ, vital to the whole. So the most effective leader, again, take it on board, will empower from the center, build trust, and mobilize individual genius. Praise God. Joseph Campbell was right, and he was wrong. He was right in that he assessed that there is, in fact, a universal narrative. He was wrong in that he failed to observe that there is one exception, and it's Jesus. Jesus is the one counter-narrative in all of human history. And his story bears witness to itself, he said, by virtue of its character. Jesus said, if you just pay attention, you'll notice that everything that you encounter in me is what you're longing for at the deepest level of your humanity. 
Thank you this morning.